Hello, everybody. My name is Mitch Wall. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And today I'll be talking about nonlinear variability due to mode coupling in a bolted benchmark structure, along with my co-authors, Dr. Matthew Allen and Dr. Robert Keither. So as a quick overview, first I'll talk about our motivation. What are joint nonlinearities and why are we concerned with mode coupling? Then I'll talk about an overview of our experimental setup with the two sets of beams that we used. And then we'll talk about the differences between the two sets of beams that we use with their joint pressure distributions and how they contrast. Then we'll talk about our experimental results with joint nonlinearities and how it relates to mode coupling. Here's a quick intro for those of you that might not be familiar. Basically, all structures have bolted joints in them. Here's an example of a jet engine with a ring of bolted joints holding together different sections of the engine. These are really important because they can be responsible for up to 90% of the damping in some structures. So if you want to design a lightweight and efficient structure, it's really useful to accurately know the damping. The mechanism causing this damping is nonlinear in nature, and that is frictional slipping at the contact interface. This happens as you increase load amplitude, you typically get a increase in damping and a decrease in the frequency of the structure. What we see happening is that at the contact interface of a bolted joint out towards the edges of, of the contact and the low, lower pressure region, you start getting slip out in this region. And then as load amplitude increases, this slip region will increase, the nonlinearity will increase until the joint ends up slipping entirely. We're typically concerned about the uh, regime before the entire joint slips and we call that micro slip. So much effort has been put towards modeling bolted joint nonlinearities and making accurate models of how structures change with frequency. A lot of you might be familiar with methods like quasi-static modal analysis or the multi-harmonic balance method. And these methods have mostly been focused on modeling single mode excitations or excitations where coupling between modes has been negligible. And this has been successful in many ways over, over the last couple of years. We've been able to get good results with things like modeling the actual slip in a joint using a fine, uh, finely meshed fine element model or using I1 elements. And the advantage of assuming, of assuming that there's no mode coupling simplifies your model a lot because you can use the mode shapes to simplify your system down to a set of uncoupled single degree of freedom nonlinear equations. But we wanted to ask the question, when does this assumption actually hold up experimentally? And can we find an example of where it doesn't hold up? The tests that we will present here show an example of where mode coupling is actually really significant. And all of the data that is shown here and much more is available to anybody that might want to work on modeling mode coupling in, in jointed structures. So here is a view of our experimental setup. The structure we used is called the S4 beam. This consists of two beams bolted together with one bolt at each end and a gap in the middle right here. We tested two sets of beams. One we'll call the 2017 set of beams. These were tested at Sandia National Labs a couple of years ago. They focused not on mode coupling, but we can still use their measurements for validating our new measurements and such. The 2020 beams were the focus of a new paper from Brink, but they focused mostly on the linear parameters. And now we're focusing on how we can characterize the nonlinear parameters of the structure. We used free free boundary conditions, hanging the beams from these bungee cords here. And we used load washers to pre precisely measure the tension in the bolt um, for, for a given torque applied to it. The test consisted of a low amplitude test to first find the mode shapes and then a higher amplitude test to record the ring down and actually characterize the nonlinearity. First, we took that ring down response, we modally filtered it, and then we bandpass filtered it around the mode that we are interested in. And then we used the Hilbert transform to calculate the damping ratio and frequency of the structure as a function of modal amplitude. The interaction between mode one and two is what is of interest in this presentation. So we chose different input locations, different drive points to get different combinations of amplitudes for mode one and two. Drive point one, which is into the page, all of these drive points are into the page, but the one at the middle, drive point one, will excite mode one and mode two significantly. 
Drive point three does basically the same thing. It's just shifted a little bit over to the right. Drive point four is out towards the end over here, and that will excite mode one, mo mode two, excuse me, but is on a node for mode one. So there will be basically no mode one excitation at this drive point. And the opposite for drive point five, where we'll have a much higher mode one excitation than mode two excitation. Here I'll take a brief detour to talk about joint pressure distributions. As we'll soon see, these pretty similar beams will show some, some really different nonlinear properties. So we wanted to fully characterize what we think is the main contribu contributor to those discrepancies, and that is the joint topology and the pressure distribution within the joint. As I said before, the nonlinearity is caused by frictional slipping within the joint, so you can probably guess that the, sh the shape of the contact and the distribution of the pressure will have a pretty significant effect on, on how the, the nonlinearity occurs. So here we have joint surface measurements, which were taken using a coordinate measuring machine and a scanning white light interferometer for, for these structures. For the 2017 beam, we see a mostly flat interface here with kind of a constant angle on it. For the 2020 beam, it also looks like it kind of has an angle on it, but we see this kind of wavy pattern in here as well. We use these measurements to modify the positions of nodes on a finely meshed finite element model of the S4 beam. So we actually move, move nodes up and down depending on these measurements to model the topology in the finite element model. And then when we go and find the, uh, find the pressure distribution within the joint as preload increases, we see for the 2020 beam, we get about three strips of contact in here, which kind of makes sense because we saw a little bit of waviness on the actual measurements before. And for the 2017 beam, since it was quite a bit flatter, we end up seeing something really different. We see that all the contact is really just focused around the bolt hole in there. And this will go to explain some of the discrepancies that we'll see later when we get to the uh, nonlinear damping and frequency results. We put some work into validating our measurements for the 2017 beam. If you're interested in the validation for the 2020 beam, they did it in a different way in the Brink paper, but this is what we have presented here for the 2017 beam. The way we did this here is that we measured the frequency of the experimental structure at a couple of different preloads and then solved for the frequencies of the finite element model while preloading the model at, at various levels. And we end up seeing that the frequency shift from the finite element model matches the frequency shift experimentally uh, pretty closely. And this was pretty unexpected, I guess, because you can't model this shift at all with a flat on flat finite element model um, because of the way that the solver works. So we can tell that by adding this topology information to the joint interface, we are increasing the fidelity of the finite element model quite a bit. The other interesting thing here is that you can kind of pick out the nonlinear modes just by checking out the preload shift, the frequency shift with preload. For modes three and four, we see basically no shift down here. Those are modes that we knew to be linear. For modes one and two, the nonlinear modes that are interested in, in this work, and for mode six, which we also knew to be nonlinear, we see a pretty significant shift as the, as the preload increases in the experiment and the finite element model. Now we'll actually talk about how the damping on the left here and the frequency on the right here change with modal amplitude. First, I'll talk about the 2017 beam for mode one and two, and then I'll talk about the 2020 beam for mode one and two. For mode one, we see a pretty repeatable curve for damping and frequency, regardless of what drive point is used, regardless of what modes are in the response. Although this is the opposite of the trend that we would expect for a typical microslip nonlinearity, where here as amplitude increases, our damping is going down, and as amplitude increases, our frequency is going up, which is opposite of what we would expect. So the main conclusion here is that coupling appears to be negligible for this mode. For mode two, we see a very different conclusion. For here, we see at different drive points, we get a really large spread in the possible frequency and damping curves that you can get. For drive point one and three, which is again where we have a mode one and a mode two in the response, we see not only a large variance between the two drive points, but within the drive point. For basically the same test, you can get 
a wide range of different damping and frequency curves. For drive point four, where we have a isolated mode two response, those are the red curves down here. These kind of represent a minimum amount of nonlinearity that can exist in the system. So that can kind of approximate the uncoupled response of mode two. For drive point five, that was where we had much more mode one in the response than mode two. We still get some mode two response, so we can plot it here, but we can see that it's pretty repeatable, although the amount of nonlinearity is significantly higher than what we saw at drive point four. So here the conclusion is that for mode two, uh, we presumably see it coupled to mode one because we're changing the amount of mode one in each of these excitations and it has a really large effect on what mode two is doing. Here we have the 2020 beam going back to mode one. The first thing we'll notice here is that we pre see a pretty atypical shape in the damping and frequency curves. We get an increase, which we expect, but then we get a, a decrease in damping at higher amplitudes. And then for frequency, we see a decrease, which we expected, but then it increases and kind of waves around over here, which can't be explained by just the microslip model. But regardless, we can still make the same conclusions about mode coupling here. So in this kind of frequency range in here, we can see that for these two different drive points, we still get a pretty repeatable uh, damping curve and a pretty re repeatable frequency curve. So again, we can make the conclusion that coupling appears to be negligible for mode one in the in the structure. For mode two, same story with kind of getting the weird wavy damping and, and frequency curves. But we can again make the same conclusions for coupling with regards to mode two as we did with the 2017 structure. So first for drive point one, where we have mode one and mode two and excited, we see a pretty large variance in what the damping and frequency are doing. But when we have an isolated mode two response at drive point four, we get all these curves to line up on, on each other pretty well, disregarding some uh, low amplitude outliers that we had down here. So again, we can say that mode two coupling is sig significant as you're changing the amount of mode one in the response. So we can make a few different conclusions from this data. The first is that two nominally identical beams can have pretty different nonlinear properties. For the 2017 beam, we saw a normal microslip nonlinearity for mode two, but not for mode one. For 2020, we saw some aspects that were consistent with the microslip nonlinearity, but then others that weren't. We're attributing this mostly to the different kinds of pressure distributions within the joint. Remember for the 2017 beam, we had a more of a circular contact patch focus around the bolt, but for the 2020 beam, we had kind of three strips of contact going along the joint interface. And we could show that for both of these beams, what, what we think is mode coupling is dominating the response of the system for mode two. For mode one, we can show that it's pretty repeatable regardless of the drive point. For mode two, we can get a repeatable response if it's isolated from mode one. But when you combine mode one and mode two in the, in the response, it introduces a lot of variability in, into mode two, indicating that the nonlinearity for mode two can be influenced by mode one. So this work shows that in the future, in order to accurately characterize damping and voltage structures, we need to make sure that we're taking into account mode coupling for at least some structures. So this leaves us again with a few questions. How will mode coupling affect our approach to modeling joints in the future? And can current methods like the multi-harmonic balance or QSMA maybe be adapted in some way to account for uh, multiple mode excitations? So thank you all for your time, and I hope you found this inter interesting. And again, we have all this data available and much more for anybody that might be interested in working on this problem. Thank you.